no problem. Ah, okay, it is recording. Um, so welcome back, everybody. This is an episode of Humaning, uh, which is an interintellect special where we like to bring together a couple of hosts um, and active members of our community to discuss something that we think uh, is of general interest through their own personal experiences. Um, and today we will be talking about the very majestic topic of the scientist in society. Uh, but in reality, we will talk about what it means to be interested in science versus identifying as a scientist noun. And we will explore this through academic psychology and psychological research, but also through Renzo's example, through a self-taught physics what it means to one day wake up and find yourself insanely interested in one area of science or the other, and what are the, uh, the steps that you can take to get closer to your goal of deeper learning, being accepted maybe in that community, um, and maybe what is the step that you have to take to be employed or to be able to teach other people as well. Um, we think that this is a very timely topic. Uh, we are living through a pandemic, um, a public health crisis um, that puts scientists on the spot in an often very beautiful way. Um, but we are also seeing deeper engagement from, from the public when it comes to scientific analysis uh, or data gathering. Um, and we're also going through a major, I would say, probably um, lasting transformation in academia. Uh, and people are rethinking what it means to be an academic, what campus life means, uh, which used to be, at least in the past 100 years, uh, this used to be an integral part of, you know, being allowed to identify as a scientist. Like, are you affiliated with with a, with a laboratory, with, with an academic institution? So um, without further ado, I'm going to just dive into uh, the life story of Isabella Granik, uh, who is joining us um, as, uh, as a psychologist and a, a psychology professor uh, from Radboon University that I don't know how to pronounce properly. I'm currently <laughs> okay. based in Toronto. <laughs> um, and Renzo, whose background is, is software engineering, but who is a writer and a self-taught um, physicist, currently um, based in Oakland, California. So we are, and I'm in Brussels, so we are in three completely different time zones and greatly enjoying it. Um, Isabella, maybe would you like to uh, just like tell us the ab ovo story of Isabella Granik uh, and how, how what, when was the first moment when you felt Oh, I'm going to I'm going to be a researcher. I'm going to study humans. What what was the process? Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a different angle to the question of uh, why I do what I do. So when was the first time? I, I can't even remember the first time. I mean, what what brought me most? Um, what started me interested in human psychology was books, novels, literature, poetry, but mostly books, novels, fiction mostly. Um, and so I was an undergrad in literature, English literature and psychology. And had I known I was going to end up in academia, I probably would have stayed in literature. Um, because, but you know what, at that time anyway, which was, I don't know, 25 years ago or so, um, literature wasn't going to be a very easy, you know, area that I might find an actual job in. And so I went into psychology because indeed I am interested in human, you know, nature and so on. Um, and that was going to be my way to kind of make money and have a job and get a life and so on. So uh, I, apart from a three year gap between undergrad and graduate school, which was way more interesting than everything else of the, my story, I just was on a straight and narrow path of graduate school, then PhD, then I got an assistant prof position and a research scientist position, and then eventually got offered sort of the dream academic job as a full prof um, with tenure in the Netherlands. So I moved from Toronto to the Netherlands to pursue that. And in terms of research, you know, I, I went quickly from being interested in clinical psychology because I thought that's when you get to like really get into human nature and understand people. But you slowly realize, unless you're a very talented therapist, is that you get a lot of people who sound exactly the same because we are so similar to one another asking for the same kind of help. And for me, it wasn't enough to like really, I don't know, click with me. So research on the other hand, allowed me to go into places that, and constantly re uh, invent myself in terms of what I was interested in and so on. So I started with complexity science and how to apply that in psychology and into social groups and, and diet, parent child dyads and so on. That's always ran through the complexity science sort of principles have always run through all my uh, research. And now I mostly focus on 
how to build and evaluate uh, technology like games and apps for um, emotional resilience and also for the prevention of anxiety and depression. So that's sort of the nutshell. I love this so much. We had um, Brian Cam and Jenna Gorlin on Humaning a couple of months ago. Um, and Brian Cam is your friend and another um, intern tech host who is very interested in complexity science himself. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to kind of have them together. I didn't really see the immediate parallel between this Humaning episode and that one. Yeah. But I think there is some something going on. I wanted to ask you about it because I'm an English major myself and, and I'm really curious who would be maybe your top picks of writers that now as a trained, you know, established psychologist and psychology professor, you would say were the most knowledgeable or intriguing um, when it comes to the psychological understanding of people. Because we know that all writers think they are. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Which ones are right? I mean, unfortunately, I'm going to give you the basics that you would probably not be surprised that I'm going to say, like, I would say Tolstoy had it right, Virginia Woolf had it right. Um, George Eliot got, had it right. Uh, you know, I mean, the, those those writers whose sort of um, world was about understanding people. And I mean, Shakespeare got it right, right? Like there's a lot of people who argue that we didn't even understand personalities as a thing until he sort of, sort of wrote them out for us. Like, never mind Freud who came later, but, um, you know, his plays do things around social dynamics and personality dynamics and these intricate, and I mean, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, like, so th those are still the ones that I would go past. And I've, I've long actually going to talk to you about a salon around um, how fiction helps us understand ourselves. But I'm, I've long thought those writers do a much better job than most of our introduction to psychology textbooks. Ooh, I love this. I mean, you know that I've, I've long been campaigning for uh, for Tolstoy uh, Salon series. Um, well, the, the reading list is not going to be a uh, short there, even if it just contains one or two titles. Who got it wrong? Do you have a do you have a blacklist of uh, of, of writers uh, that you think? I, I have I have them with filmmakers. I have a, I have a couple of yeah. Um, I mean in my mind where I'm like oh my god this director was just like so wrong about women for instance yeah so, yeah it's a, good, win an award. <laughs> it's a good question like I want to look behind me but of course everything that I look behind me on I love because there's still things that I you know pick up um you know I think to me the reason why most or a lot of contemporary uh books don't turn me on is that they're they're more about plot and they're more about the god shit gotcha kind of gimmicky kind of things that have less to do with understanding people and that's the same thing for movies by the way right like when's the last movie that you watched where the two hours is a couple just about to get divorced but they're in their living room right those are the, those are the movies that i still love um and they're not the movies that are making the blockbuster money so in a similar way i don't even i don't know how to like really off the top of my head say these authors suck but I would say a lot of the writers right now because you don't take a lot of time in the conversation in the personality dynamics um I mean Sander Marai is one of my favorite favorite writers because he's a, he, he's Hungarian and he's just what he does with personality and just a drawn out conversation right by a fireplace right you could literally teach an entire uh class on that book so this is so interesting, and I, I you know, I want to uh, uh, jump to physics a little bit. I, but you know, a lot of us actually go into fields of studies or or um, or actual you know careers because we are so inspired by heroes of fiction, right? And and you know, there are many many, for instance, psychologists in in fiction and you know, recent cinema, for instance. And and I have a couple of uh, psychologist friends who are really deeply distressed when they see. Uh, psychologists being misrepresented in fiction uh, and not just when it's negative but also when it's overly positive so for instance if you have movies like goodwill hunting or ordinary people right. where you kind of see this saint of a therapist who saves somebody's life and then you know they are in their office and some or mr robot and somebody comes in and they kind of expect this you know on the couch and you're like mm, that's not going to happen sorry that's not what we do here yeah um, so I don't know how, how that goes for, uh, I, I know there are a very, uh, very active reddits on what um, different science fiction movies get wrong about physics. 
So I'm quite curious, Renzo, how uh, how maybe uh, your inspirations uh, drew from um, uh, drew on, on on science fiction and how how you're feeling about uh, the, the the your representation in in fiction as a physicist. Mm, um, because now I'm I'm trying to pull like a um, a recent example of like a physicist that is that is portrayed probably not necessarily uh, the best way. Well, I, I will say it's interesting. I watched the, um, the, the Stephen Hawking biopic and it was certainly, it certainly glossed over a lot of the, uh, the complications that came about from his personality, uh, obviously his, uh, his physical health. And so it was, that, I guess that's an example where I was, I was watching that and I was just obviously like inspired and awed by Stephen Hawking, but also having to sort of, um, I guess temper that down with the the reality of who Stephen Hawking was, and I, I think that happens a lot with physicists where they they do great work and then they get sanitized and lionized, and we we sort of lose the some of the nuance and quality that would actually allow us to appreciate them, appreciate them as as people and the work that came from them as people because it's intimately related to who they were as people, the work that they chose to do and the way they went about doing it. I love this so much, and and I, I would like to ask you a little bit, you know, as we go into your intro, um, about your role models. Every time, you know, we discuss physics, or you are in the, you know, Interintact forum, or your tweets, or your blog posts, you, you know, you're you're extremely knowledgeable and very committed to some of the heroes of physics, and you seem to be deeply inspired by by their example. So I would really really love to um to hear more about, you know, how you started on your current journey uh, as a basically independent researcher in physics, right? Self-appointed, self-taught, uh, self-discovered and beloved by everybody. Um, and how these role models played a role. And I, I'm curious about this because, you know, when, we, when it comes to, uh, maybe this is true in, in psychology as well, when it comes to the great role models of these uh, fields, you know, your mind jumps to 1915 or 1931, uh, but those people lived in a very different world. Mm. And, you know, even if you become, you know, a world-renowned psychologist, you're not going to be fried. I hope, you know. Um, so, so I'm really, really interested in the um, in the in the roles of the role models here. Um, if you want to share a bit about that. Uh, yeah. Well, so the, I guess the, the quick background as as to how I ended up here is and this is I this is something that is important for me to to say like. Um, at all times is that I hated mathematics. I hated it deeply. I despised it. I despised the people that enjoyed it. I, it, it and so this was very core cool to my identity for, I want to say like 20 something years. And so then I ended up getting into programming by way of like audio engineering. I was like, well, let's see how they make the programs that make music. And I, so I, I, I enrolled in Lambda and they have sort of a, a ethos of like digging deep and just, you know, like, look under the hood. And so I ended up, I guess, drilling down through computer science into sort of the, the mathematical formalisms and the logic that underlies it. And I was like, well, this is, this stuff is interesting. I, I'm enjoying it. And after a period of time, I, I looked up and I was like spending a Saturday afternoon doing mathematics. And I was like, oh no, oh, you, and it, but so once I realized, I was like, okay, so I actually like this stuff proper. I carried on with uh, carried on with that, and then after maybe a few months, it, it hit me. I was like, "Well, mathematics was the, the big barrier between me and physics, and so now that that barrier is not there anymore, it's um, time to go ahead and e explore that." And so that was um, bolstered by uh, people like Sabina Hassenfelder, um, Eric Weinstein, Susskind lectures, etc. And so. Um, and Susskind is one of the is probably one of the first people that I look up to like like as a hero as a as a role model because his his lectures were straightforward and educated and I was like oh so this stuff doesn't have to be completely opaque and obtuse so you can actually just tell people what's happening and then they can you know do with that as they do with that as they please. I heard that Eric Weinstein hated mathematics in school as well. I think he, he spoke about this in a, in a podcast that he discovered it later on through physics. Um, and so it's a really interesting thing to, uh, you know, 
to think about mathematics that for some people, you know, is the driver to get into programming, to get into economics, uh, architecture, any other area. And for some people, it's just this major impediment that stops them from, you know, familiarizing themselves with something that they, later on will become the passion of their lives. Uh, so that's, that's super, super interesting. And was there a specific area of physics that first uh, interested you? Um, I know that at the time you were working on, on programming, right? So you were coming from kind of the angle of computers. So uh, was, it, was it related in any way or was, your, was the attraction based on the fact that it's so different? Yeah, I, I guess the uh, computer programming led me to mathematics, which led me to physics, but it's it's pretty, I guess, un, unrelated to the programming. It was just like, you know, you go through a couple of doors and now it's like, oh, wait, I'm in a, I'm in a whole other, other uh, building now. And so um, the, I mean, in, in general, it was just, it was quantum physics, but I'm trying to um, pull, pull back if, if, if there is anything specific about that, that, um, that jumped out out at me and I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure that I can. I, I guess I'm, once I realized I was into it, I was like, I'm here for the whole thing. And so, uh, yeah, it's just the, the broad field. Thank you so much. So what the most interesting thing that you both said, which I love, and I would love to kind of like come back to this, uh, most interesting in the subtext was this idea of joy, right? That you discover something that, Maybe you studied in a different field. You studied in English literature. You started doing something else, uh, or you thought you are not good at this, or you're not good at that. And then suddenly you find joy in something. And and I'm wondering, is this um, does it bother you that you happened upon it by accident? So, for instance, Isabella, are you think ever thinking that oh, I should have had a mentor when I was 16 who should have maybe opened these doors earlier for me? I'm, or is it normal? Is this something that we should we should we should be finding um, by accident on our I don't know journeys in in life? Yeah, I mean, for me, I don't. It's not that I regret any. To, to some degree, I'm here because of following a lot of the joys, and I said no to a bunch of other things that I could have done. I I was. I'm not telling you about the failures in economics that I failed twice. I'm not telling you about the two statistics courses that oh I. Oh my failed god! Please do tell us. Please do tell us. No, I, I'm I'm very happy to undo <laughs> all of those myths that I got to full professor before 40 years old, and I failed two statistics classes. It took me three years to get to undergrad uh, to graduate school. So I got rejected three times before getting in and made it to the you know top of what presumably is where you get to in academia was still with those failures. So, so I, I have no regrets around not having met somebody earlier. And in fact, I think the, the only thing that I think is um, right now would be regretful is if I did not sort of communicate this either to my mentees or to my two 15 year old boys, that you, there is no it, there is no, the following the joy is the process and the point. There is no one joy that you follow like, oh, I found dynamic systems and now it applies. It, that was amazing, but I actually got bored with it when I realized, well, this is how the world works, period. Do I have to keep banging this thing on it and I'll move on to something else that gives me, and to me, the joy and a learning curve are almost synonymous for work for me, right? Like to be on something where I'm still trying to discover and figure out and then share with other people and then it gets boring. So for me, science was great because you get the grant writing process out you then it's just ideas and you have no idea if anybody's going to pick it up you finally get it that joy lasts about 30 seconds and then you're off to doing the thing and then the freaking data never ever complies to your like beating it right but you finally have a story that you discover through that data and then the writing part even though i love writing that write up at the end is the most boring part for me. I'm like, eh, okay, I already know all of this and now get it out there and something that's, that's why I much prefer writing uh, review articles now and so on, because it's a, a you know, a taller look or a, a look from uh, above around a whole field of study or something like that. So yeah, so to me, the joy is around the learning and the, and finding that in different avenues. And I would never have found just one anyway. So I think that's a bigger point for me. I love this so much. And you have uh, your 15 year old twins and, and they are incredibly intelligent and, and inquisitive people. So I, I can imagine that a lot of the things that you, you've you learned, um, you have an audience for, for that knowledge in the house. Um, 
this, yeah. is, this is amazing. What, what, what do you think, Isabella, is, um, what is the main, maybe for other people who have teenagers at home or who are in the process of deciding whether they really want to devote their lives to some research um, area that they're very passionate about, what, what, what should this person be uh, careful about? Is there a joy killer? Is there something that maybe seems innocent but in the long run it compounds into something that will turn you away from from this kind of dedication and dedicated research yeah it's a really good question i mean for me the joy killer is doing things for the wrong reasons status the money the even the like followers or whatever it is that is so sh and money mm, anyway you're not going to get that much in in terms of uh science and, and research that much money you usually don't do it for that reason um, but and those markers are just the wrong ones to chase if if what you want is the joy of learning and continuing to learn and reinventing yourself and those sorts of things. And I think, you know, people often ask me, you know, when they're trying to pick a graduate school or something like that, what should I look for? And they usually do the exact opposite of the things that I would suggest. They, what they look at usually is the institution and the prestige of that institution, then the, the uh, topic, and then the supervisor. And I would flip it entirely and say, the first thing you want to do is have a click with the person that you're going to work with. It's almost, which is really weird, almost regardless of the topic. Because if you have a really cool person that you click with, they'll help you find the thing that makes you alive. Then it's the, you know, topic would be nice that you like jive on or whatever it is. And only last is the institution. It just doesn't matter if you don't have a great person who you're working with. And then maybe a great lab, but great people have great labs and people who suck in terms of mentorship have horrible labs and everybody's competitive and you will never learn anything and you will just drop out and be burnt out and learn the wrong things through that system. Not that I have a strong opinion about that or anything. So yeah. Not that this ever happened. This is something you heard from other people. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. <laughs> Me yeah. too, I've never, this, this is something <laughs> that never happened ever. Um, oh my God, I love this so much. And I can imagine that, I always think that a good leader is usually somebody, you think that, oh, a good leader is somebody who had experiences with good leadership but I think it's many many times it's the other way around it's somebody who becomes the leader that they would have, have liked to have had right that yeah that's true and I think academia is a particularly difficult place like there's you know there's a lot of things I still respect and love about academia and it is the right place for a lot of people to do their science for sure and it's also maybe a time of your career right like I am now you know I hit 50 little you know literally the middle age crisis kind of thing and for now it's not anymore what I want to do um, whereas at 30 that was the only thing and it was it was the right thing to do to get me to the places that I needed to do and now having mentored these amazing bright minds all I want to do is be closer and have a bigger impact to that training realm and mentoring them and have them make an impact way faster than I could have earlier on. So there's there's ways now to find your joy and your connection um, that can sort of that that bridge more conventional institutions that are were made for that. Um, and now sort of learning institutions online kind of hybrid situations. And, and hopefully I can be sort of in the middle of that. I mean, it's so interesting to me because the two of you, I think are maybe the two most kind of mentorship minded of, of all the fellow inter-intellects. Right, so Isabella, you actually brought one of your um, your students, PhD students, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, Nastasia Griffin, into the community, who is your partner at your salons, who hosts her own wonderful salon series, and uh, who, who who was scribing at salons, so taking very masterful notes. She participated with you um, in in a host training session that was kind of focusing on the question of mentorship. And Renzo, you started basically self-educating and kind of co-mentoring uh, with another fellow intern, in fact, and host called Sagar Devkata, who is, I mean, you guys last year when you entered the community basically started learning physics and math almost from scratch in, 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 in some areas and teaching each other and teaching the public right away, right? So if I'm not mistaken, you guys had like a month of a head start and then just did a salon and then published articles and you know, people were running after you, but it was not like, oh, they are mentors so far ahead. It was more like inviting and engaging a community of people to learn with you. Uh, how did that process start? How did you and Sagar meet in the first place? And, and where is that project now? Oh, that's that's um, 
so it's it's funny i just i had realized that i was interested in mathematics and physics and i just um <clears throat> i posted that i was interested in the math channel and then he just he just gave me he was like hey uh you're you're about that life and I'm about that life too so let's go and we we spent um you know a couple weeks a couple months shorting um shooting messages back and forth trying to figure out exactly um exactly what we were we were going to do and then he uh, he was like, "Hey, there's this book, Lost in Math, by uh, Sabina Hassenfelder that he had um, caught wind of, and he had read a little bit. He was like, I think this would be this would be um, great for us.' And it was he was very much correct because in 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 my opinion, that's not a uh, that's not a pop science book. I know there's a little, a little bit of a side eye sometimes, but like it's it's a very straightforward conceptual introduction to uh, the layout of modern physics and it was so high quality that from there i was like okay i i understand what certain terms mean i can go and find the associated mathematics and sort of reverse reverse engineer um etc etc and so um yeah that that's kind of how that that started and um i as far as what we're working on now, there are a couple there are a couple things that have to stay under under wraps because they are still um, in the in the planning phase. But I, I will say, Segar has quite a deep understanding of um, I know electronics and communications and machine learning. So I am I am trying to get him to go into quantum machine learning or uh, quantum communications. But also, I will he has his own um, passions and desires for physics. So I'm sure he will he will. Um, settle on on a a thing that's proper for him and i haven't haven't entirely said anything myself so yeah Karaka, you're like i'm trying to inspire my friend to be go into quantum mechanics quantum computing good um anything that starts with quantum um i i would imagine uh it will be very fitting for uh for um for cigar this is amazing um really really curious about i um, you know Physics, psychology, obviously, on on a superficial glance, very uh, far away from each other on the spectrum of different sciences. Um, do you do you ever um, do you ever wonder how your field is is seen from from another um, area of science? Is there an internal competition between different fields in that? I know there is within fields, uh, but when it comes to yeah, I love Mira Strober's book, Interdisciplinary Conversations, when, you know, in the 70s at Stanford, she was trying to bring together um, different departments, and it sometimes just kind of ended up in a shouting match, um, even when everybody kind of came together with the best intentions. Do you, do you have multidisciplinary um, ambitions in that sense, and do you think that's, that's important um, in how your identity um, is, is structured? Do you want to be able to identify, like, I am a scientist, I'm a researcher, I identify with all other researchers from other areas as well, or is it more about your own team? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. certainly, uh, You go ahead. I'm, just, I'm multiple, multidisciplinary because I was a musician before I was, I was um, a neophyte physicist or an initiate, but um, so that um, I'm multidisciplinary in that aspect. And I think Physics is, has a lot of multidisciplinary history. Physicists they go off into another field and they will they will interact with the researchers and they will find it they'll find something and make a discovery and that's part of the beauty of physics but also the beauty of, of combining disciplines and as far as research I I do identify regardless of where people do research I identify with all researchers because all researchers are doing battle with the unknown and even if it's different parts of the unknown, it's the same unknown total. So I, I have huge respect for anyone who wakes up every day and, and, and does that. Thank you so much. Isabella, what, uh, you also uh, started sharing a story. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many angles to this. So so I'm deeply interested in interdisciplinary work and even trying to get the nomenclatures from like cross-disciplinary to multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary and the, the eventual place that um, a couple of us are trying to get to is talking about what transdisciplinary it is, uh, transdisciplinarity is in that you have something that among a bunch of uh, people working across disciplines and starting to learn each other's language 
what you're creating and what when you're working hardest and at your best is when you're in somebody else's territory giving insights from from the lens of but not going back to your own disciplinary silo and the conversations that happen there are emergent they're really they do a lot to the social dynamics as much as how well-read people are or how much it's their determination to to get into uncomfortable places and to shake their own credentials and their own sense of calm in their own knowledge up and in those spaces and i've been in you know a few now there is some kind of alchemy that happens that you get the the you know the classic the the end product is much more than the sum of its parts and so there's all sorts of practices and processes and and um ways of starting conversations and how to work with one another and it also has to do with not only um, you know, disciplines talking to one another, but hierarchies talking to one another and flattening those hierarchies. Of course, there's going to be people who know more or have longer time in a discipline that can easily give you the, the shortcut to a particular answer. But there's also the new people in the discipline who give you these new insights and new angles that you hadn't thought about. And when there's a respect across those hierarchies, and the, again, it doesn't mean that you're equalizing those hierarchy, hierarchical levels, but that you have things to, to learn from each other. What I loved about Lorenzo's descri description of learning math with this person he just met was that I think there's some odd magic that can happen when you have a similar goal, you're coming from different angles and you are sort of open hearted in terms of your own knowledge, vulnerabilities, you know, hard spots that you don't understand and you can share that with somebody. And there are these amazing partnerships across time. And the, you know, the common ones you'll hear is McCartney and, and Lennon and, um, and you know, you know, all of these interesting, uh, we actually have a salon, um, Brian Cam and I have a salon around networked collaboration, but I'm really interested in what network minds can do not only through Rome versus Notion for whatever, but how we can actually talk with one another and how to build tools that are like, just like Zetelkasten has a model for how to think by yourself and, and give yourself nodes uh, to be able to um, recapture at different times of your own process of thinking. What I'm deeply interested in and Brian and I are talking about is how interconnected minds, is there a, a good model that extends that individual model, not only in, in the case of how do we do this, but then methodologies by which you can actually um, interact with other minds so that you can efficiently come to more innovative answers to particular problems. And you can do it in creative ways that you wouldn't have otherwise had in everybody being in their own like offices and so on. That's a very long answer to the <laughs> question of interdisciplinarity but anyway yes i love this and it kind of like takes you back to uh, the question of the role models from 100 years ago right uh, because in many ways their kind of collaborative models were very different right the what what meant what communality meant for instance for the einsteins of the world i you know I, I, correspondences and, and conferences but then you had these giants, right, and the individual invention. And then you have the other end of it today, which is, you know, that people are arguing for Nobel Prizes no longer being given to individuals because, you know, laboratory level innovation no longer happens um, individually. Maybe it never has, but it certainly doesn't today. Um, and what often happens is that just the leader of the laboratory will be credited with you know, what actually was the work of 200 people. Um, and so it's really interesting. And, and although Interinsect is not, you know, a community of scientists, we do have a lot of scientists in the community and, and you guys are kind of, you know, living your own lives um, and doing your own thing uh, within, within our kind of city of mind. So that's, that's super, super interesting to me. Um, Renzo, have you ever, because I know that you guys have, it's here, um, um, Stanislav Lem's books, the Summer Technologica. Uh, you guys want to actually do a series about that, which is, you know, a, a fiction writer uh, kind of uh, writing about science. Um, and I'm curious whether you have had any, um, you know, any um, any activity in the in the field of humanities or, or fiction yourself. Uh, we kind of started with science fiction, so uh, this is maybe a nice kind of circling back to that. I I am. 
I'm I'm not quite versed in in humanities. That is that is something I should probably uh, have. I should probably take some time to go ahead and and ex explore that. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm music. Sure. Does music count as humanities? I am. I am. This. I am. I am. I am lost when you say humanities. You have to. You have to guide me. Like Isabella, you are the academic. Does it? Does it count? Under humanities, I would. I mean, I mean, I would call art art, and I would call music probably separate from that. But that's also, you know, the these boundaries I think are increasingly. Um, one of my favorite neuroscientists, for example, does music with EEG brain waves, right? And so, and with dancers too, right? So there are dancers with EEG um, headsets on while they're dancing to different types of music, and then the music then iterates back through the, the brain waves of the, um, the dancers. So there's so many like really, really transdisciplinary kind of interactions that I don't know what to call art, science, humanities used to be whatever, like the, the classic ones, but you know, I don't know, sociology, anthropology. I love this idea of transdisciplinarity. This sounds amazing. I think this is what we do. I just didn't know it was called that way. Yeah. <laughs> there's not a lot of us doing that, but yeah. Oh, this is fantastic. Maybe you guys should collaborate and, and create a, a musical quantum project uh, that um, promotes, um, you know, mental well-being for teens uh, through video games. I would totally <laughs> take, take my money. <laughs> Let's do a Kickstarter right now. Um, thank you so much. And as we're wrapping up, I, you know, I'm quite curious about the media future. And obviously, we like to kind of conclude these conversations with you know, a takeaway where people can be like, okay, I can do, go and do this myself. I, I would love to hear your notes on two things. One is what is a, a current change in the role of scientists, whether young and independent or older and maybe, you know, participating in, in, in established academia um, that you've noticed and, and maybe that you think is, is a positive thing that we should focus more on. And, and I would love also to hear about your next steps uh, and what you're working on now and whether these two things are, and I think they are, um, connected. Um, Renzo, maybe would you like to, um, to say a few words about what are the, the societal changes that you notice through your work and, and what's next for you? Yeah, there, well, one of the interesting things is the, the real difference between the, um, the way science and particularly physics seem to be done in what we call the heyday or the golden age, just the, the massive um, amount of freedom to um, just have a weird idea and then pursue it and be, be, taken, um, be taken serious. And also the freedom that the scientists have their, um, John Wheeler's autobiography, autobiography or uh, there's a story in him where like Niels Bohr didn't like the word fission so they went to the library and just grabbed books all day and tried to find a new word for fission and they did this on research dollars they just spent four hours in the li library and they were like because Niels Bohr said you can't say a nucleus fishes and so they they just tried to find a new word and they failed they almost settled on splitters but now we have nuclear fission and so it's just like the freedom to just be a free and somewhat childlike with science. I, I think that is that has been lost, but it's also starting to come back in terms of um, Eric. Um, um, Eric Weinstein just released a working draft of his uh, theory of everything. Stephen Wolfram has released a, a theory of everything. Garrett Lisi is working on one. So they're like, I think we're and they're they all seem to be outside of academia now, but they are you know nonetheless presenting these potential big um, big and grand um, ideas. And so I think we're shifting back to a, to a point where um, scientists can be more free, free with their, you know, their weird ideas. And some of them will no, no doubt be very fruitful. Um, Is this also your, your long-term goal to have a theory of everything? So maybe in uh, 15, 20 years, we will be sitting here and you will be uh, talking about that, Renzo? If there has been no theory of everything proven um, by that time, then, um, and if I have a, a, a solid idea that I think would be worth following, then I certainly would do it. I do have some ideas in, 
about problems in, in physics and quantum communication that I am working my way towards actually trying to um, solve the problems, write a research paper, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, that is what's on the, on the horizon as well as um, certainly some, some salons about physics and mathematics. And also I am uh, going to start a research institution. So that is, uh, that is in the plan. It's going to be education to research and then onto the industry out in, outside of academia, outside of grant fund checking, just complete and totally, just a complete and total rework of the way we go from educating people in these sciences, sciences and how that years later turns into revolutions in the industry and the industry. So, that is wow uh, i love this what what i love that you just kind of like drop it in the last moment what, what's <laughs> this is something we would do at a salon like we have one minute left let's drop like a major question and then leave people with that do you do you have a name do you have collaborators do you, can we help uh what, yeah. what's next for the research institute or is this just the dream that you're working on yeah it is it is currently in the works we're working on like a a draft for like I guess that people could read and see what the institution is gonna, gonna be um, about. I'm co-founding it um, with Yana, who is a member of the Internet Club. So if you search our name uh, in the Discord, you should you should see that. And the, the name of the institution is Radian Labs and it's going, it's Radians are a, um, a different way of speaking about degrees. And so it's a, it's a play on the fact that you can um, do degree style learning, but it would be different. So well, not necessarily a degree, but, um, yeah, that's that's going to happen and i dare them to try and stop this sounds amazing i definitely want to help and you know if we in intern tech can help in any way you just want to test the ideas on us or the logo or do a kickstarter we're here to, here to help I, I saw isabella's face she was like yes <laughs> let's do this thank you so much and isabella kind of took uh, around the circle with you what um what is maybe one thing that you know when you look at your sons and 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 you consider the next generations what is something that you think will be easier for them uh, if they choose to become researchers or what is something that is maybe more difficult and where we have to you know where we have a responsibility to come together and, and find ways to improve it and and what is next uh, for you Mm, thanks. So it's interesting because whatever I think is next for them and what's going to be great is what I get most excited about. Uh, not because it, I mean, it does, of course, have something to do with me being their mother, but also it's because they are at this exact age of picking out and getting excited about ideas or not. So um, I very much applaud uh, you, Lorenzo, for, for doing it's, it's amazing how many of us are thinking in really similar ways. So the Learning Institute or the Research Institute or the whatever institute um, is, is a really compelling idea. I hope somebody that, will actually start the whatever institute. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people starting these and I think it's in a really important way. What I think that means is that people not only are seeing the problem which they've seen for almost a century in terms of learning in school systems and the more hege hegemony of academia and so, uh, so on with its, you know, with its status markers, with its um, money, with its whatever. But I think what's really interesting is that people are also now solution focused and maybe a little bit that the pandemic might have pushed a few people to start saying, let's do this together, because anyway, we're talking about all these alternative ways of learning and anyway, we're learning and look at what we learned already and so on. So I think that kind of energy is you can't underestimate that sort of push towards something that's finally solution based rather than a lot of us who have been going, this is a problem that I'm quitting my job, I'm going to do it. And I'm also going to start an institute. The interesting thing was there was a, I can't remember who the hell said it, but it was like a Niels Bohr, but I don't, it wasn't, um, who basically said to somebody also about 40 years ago, who also wanted to start their own institute because they didn't want to you know, get grant funding anymore. And they were constantly, all they were doing was focused on that kind Kind of thing and they weren't doing the you know they were doing too much administrative and teaching stuff and not enough of the stuff that they love doing around research and so this person said here i have this great model for a new research institute where finally i can get and then and gave it to not niels bohr but somebody like that and, and this guy said look the problem with this is that you're then going to have to be the manager of this whole institute because somebody is oh, going to have to like pardon is that five minute wolfram five yes. minute wolfram yes 
Yes. And it's such a good freaking point, right? Like, I am so excited about this idea. And I'm like, oh, good, Lorenzo, go and start your institute. I will come and help. And I will just be one of those mentors you might need that some old person coming and helping a few people, very little money, almost none you need to pay me. Because the starting up and the building of this stuff takes very different expertise than it does for the people who love to do the science, right? So it's those partnerships across the disciplines are really necessary. Commercial people who know what the hell they're doing, funding funders and fundraisers, people who know how to talk to the public and raise awareness in a way that all of that, I'm sure you've got it covered. But I think it's very, very much along the same similar lines that I've been thinking with some of my colleagues, but they are there are levels of pragmatic issues that all of us, I think, are are worrying about and, and also excited about actually. There's no play without some adult in the room. Sadly, yeah. um, if you want to, if you want the game to be infinite, you have to have um, structures. And um, this is super interesting. I and I, I'm going to like mark it in my diary uh, that this was 6th of April, 2021. Um, and maybe in like five years, I will come back to it on the same day, and we will look at what the, what the hell happened with your institutes. <laughs> We'll see. Did you end up founding one together? Uh, did you join someone? Did you join someone else's? Um, it's going to be my little uh, anniversary day, sixth of April, uh, for uh, for checking the personal institutions. And that is super funny, actually. Um, I was just talking with Simon Didio, the physicist, yesterday, um, who will be hosting an intern Jackson on the fourth of June at seven p.m. EST. Um, and he's associated with the Santa Fe Institute. And and maybe you know from Twitter that I'm a huge fan of Jessica Flack and her um, you know ideas of cooperation and, and complexity science um, and game theory and I think Santa Fe Institute is one of these you know amazing examples of you can actually create a new institute based on new principles and I can imagine that yeah of course it has to be managed by somebody and and there is a probably a finance person there and the personnel person there and, and an acquisitions person there and all the people who, who are needed to run a, uh, an organization but it still can keep its freshness and uniqueness um, provided that the founding principles are are good and and and, and kept too um, yeah and and iterating on these things are really important it's just the new sort of for me it's a new order of learning models mentorship models like and there there are so many ways and internet intellect is an example of a community that can also allow for fostering of the ideas in a way that makes it for you can try out things low failure mode and see what other people think and so on and i think those those are more and more kind of emerging and i think it's really really important part of the whole structure I think this is a beautiful place to um, to uh, stop the video. Um, thank you so much. Any any last words? Anything we didn't cover and you would really like people to check out? Read yeah, the next. Rock's textbook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, do, do do you want me to uh, share the um, Do you want to share the URL now, and then I will also add it to the comments. Sure. That's great. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you thank so you much, guys. And Renzo will send me the, the URL. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording.